and welcome to the QCOS 2020 State Election Leaders Debate. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of country on whose land we meet and their continuing con connection to land, sea and community. We pay respect to them and their cultures and to their elders both past and present and to their emerging leaders. In Brisbane, we acknowledge the Jagera and Turrbal people. Good evening and welcome to the QCOS 2020 State Election Leaders Debate. We'll allow a few more minutes for people to join the stream and be back with you shortly to commence the event. Good evening and welcome to QCOS 2020 State Election Leaders Debate. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of country on whose land we meet and their con continuing connection to land, sea and community. We pay respect to them and their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. In Brisbane, we acknowledge the Jagera and Turrbal peoples. My name is Professor Susan Harris-Rimmer. I'm the Director of the Griffith University Policy Innovation Hub and co-convener of the Griffith University Gender Equality Research Network. I'll be your moderator for this evening's de debate and it is a privilege to be here. This evening, we gather to hear from Labor's Minister for Communities, Disability Services and Seniors, the Honourable Coralie O'Rourke, and LNP's Shadow Minister for Communities, Disability Services and Seniors, Dr Christian Rowan. We will hear firsthand the views of our political leaders and their commitment to the community services sector, the cost of living, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander justice, child protection, youth justice, domestic, family and sexual violence, disability and housing. A very warm welcome to our guests this evening. Welcome to the state and federal members of parliament and the director generals of Queensland government departments who are joining us online and welcome to the QCOS board. Welcome all. This evening's session will work as follows. QCOS CEO, Amy McVie, will set the scene for the community services sector and will outline QCOS's election asks. Then the Honourable Coralie O'Rourke, Minister for Communities, Disability Services and Seniors and Shadow Minister, Dr. Christian Rowan, will have 10 minutes each to outline their party platforms and detail how their parties will support vulnerable Queenslanders if elected. 
Following that, we move on to Q&A between you, our audience, and the Minister and Shadow Minister. Thank you to our members who have submitted questions already throughout the week. We have these questions lined up to get our discussion underway. Whilst we hear from QCOS CEO Amy McVie, Minister O'Rourke and Shadow Minister Rowan, I strongly encourage you to submit your questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. You can also upvote other people's questions to let us know what you most want to hear the answer to. To commence this evening's proceedings, please welcome QCOS CEO Amy McVie. Thank you so much, Sue. And can I say, we are so grateful to have your extraordinary expertise guiding tonight's debate. To begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm standing on the land of the Turrbal and Yagara people. And as we're meeting online from across the state, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that you're joining us from tonight. I would like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and to all First Nations people joining us tonight. Thank you so much to the Minister Coralie O'Rourke and Shadow Minister Christian Rowan for being with us tonight to talk about the issues impacting the community services sector and the growing number of Queenslanders who will or are experiencing disadvantage and vulnerability in the next term of Parliament. And thank you to you, to all our members and other supporters joining us online, online tonight. This election is really important to all of us. And I'm so pleased by our sector's solidarity and strength as we face these really tough times. It's statingly obvious to say that Queensland's 2020 election is being held in the most unusual of times. This year has been like nothing we've experienced before. And we've heard time and time again that things are likely to get worse before they get better. The coronavirus has put the well-being and financial resilience of Queenslanders under threat. And so from January onward, we have seen state and federal government step in to protect us from what this pandemic is capable of. Many of us have had our income secured and our health maintained. For the first time, people relying on income support have not been forced into poverty. And many people who had experienced housing insecurity and homelessness were, were given the basic dignity of a roof over their head. The strong health and economic response from our governments has made many of us feel safe. However, the measures constituting the response are temporary and we cannot be complacent. Coronavirus continues to spread around the world and in other parts of the country, as well as around the world, we've seen the devastation of second and third waves. We do continue to need strong and consistent action to protect the health of Queenslanders. From an economic perspective, we are expecting unemployment to continue to rise. Tonight, we are really keen to hear from our leaders about their vision to continue to keep Queenslanders safe, well and resilient. Over the past fortnight, QCOS has been on a road trip in regional Queensland. From Mackay to Townsville to Cairns and Toowoomba, we've heard from our members. We've heard about people doing it tough and the difficult times they're facing. As you would expect, we've heard about local issues that are different in different local areas. We've heard concerning stories about growing homelessness for older women, kids struggling to re-engage in school, and a lack of support services for people exiting prison. And while there certainly are local issues in local areas, there are consistent themes across our state. There is not sufficient public housing. There are too many people experiencing or at risk of homelessness. Unemployment is continuing to rise. And there is a concern that as jobs are created, the most disadvantaged people in our community will be let, left behind. So tonight we wanna to hear about how the next Queensland government will assist people who have been shut out of the workforce to help them to overcome the barriers that prevent them from engaging in employment opportunities if and when they arise. QCOS's priorities for this election focus on ensuring our recovery is for all Queenslanders. We have asked all parties to, con 
to commit to measures that will support the well-being and resilience of all Queenslanders, invest in local communities by creating jobs and ensure the community services sector can provide support to those who need it. To support the well-being and resilience of all Queenslanders, we're asking for funding for services that provide the no interest loan scheme. We're asking for a commitment to implement reforms to the Residential Tenancy Act and make renting fair. And, the, and we're asking that the age of criminal responsibility be raised to 14. To create thousands of jobs all around Queensland, we're asking for a significant investment in building more social housing and making social housing energy efficient. So to support the community sector to meet current and increasing demand, we're asking for adequate resourcing for the Family Matters Queensland campaign in support of working towards eliminating the overrepresentation of First Nations children in the child protection system. And we're asking for the creation of a community sector resilience fund. A survey undertaken by the COS Network in July this year showed our community services sector is under pressure. It indicated that the majority of services had experienced an increase in, in demand and that more of, than half of the services uh, surveyed had access to JobKeeper. It also showed that only one in five organisations are currently able to meet demand for services. Now, in the last month, QCOS has been undertaking our own research. And while we're not in a position to publish this research until early next year, through the interviews we've been conducting with organisations, we've heard time and time again about increased demand for services, the need for local solutions to be funded, and the willingness of organisations to employ more people if they had the funding. You know, the community services sector is one of the biggest sources of employment for Queenslanders. Also, our workforce is comprised of approximately 80% women. As JobKeeper comes away and, the, and we see the diminishing of the job seeker payments, this will put further pressure on an already stretched community services sector. Investing in establishing a community sector resilience fund will create jobs for women, fund the, the, fund the delivery of local solutions to local problems and increase support to people experiencing disadvantage and vulnerability during the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. Tonight, we're going to hear from both the LNP and the Labor Party about their approach to the next four years. Whomever forms government in Queensland after the election on the 31st of October has a monumental challenge before them. Now, our conception of this challenge is not a recovery that leads us back to the time before coronavirus. QCOS believes the challenge is greater than that. Whomever forms government in Queensland and leads us through the next four years must be driven to create a better future for all of us. So thank you again, everyone, for participating in tonight's event. I do encourage you to engage actively and ask questions for us to put to the Minister and Shadow Minister via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We want this debate to be wide ranging and informative and we want your questions to be answered tonight. Thank you again and thank you for continuing to work with QCOS as we remain resolute and committed to our vision of equality, opportunity and well-being for all Queenslanders. I would now like to introduce our political leaders for this evening. First, we will hear from the Honourable Coralie O'Rourke, Minister for Communities, Disability Services and Seniors. The Honourable Coralie O'Rourke is a former director of the community-based early learning centre in Aiken Vale, a mother of two adult children and an active member of the community. As a former teacher, Coralie understands the importance that a quality education plays in laying the foundations for a successful future for our children. Coralie has stood up and fought for one of the lowest paid industries, early childhood education and care, 
taking the industry's concerns all the way to parliament, experiencing the success that comes from standing up for what you believe in. Her passion for what is important to family and community and her belief that working together is when a community can affect great change for the better is her drive behind her commitment to the people of Mudding, Mudding Borough. Coralie has served as Minister for Communities and Minister for Disability Services and Seniors since 2015. Then we will hear from Shadow Minister for Communities, Disability Services and Seniors, Dr. Christian Rowan. Dr. Christian Rowan is the state member for Mogul in the Queensland Parliament. He's the Shadow Minister for Communities, Shadow Minister for Disability Services and Seniors, Shadow Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Partnerships and Shadow Minister for the Arts. He's previously been Shadow Minister for the Environment and Heritage Protection, and he's also been the former Minister, Shadow Minister for National Parks and the Great Barrier Reef. Christian is passionate about the development and implementation of sound evidence-based public policy for his electorate and for Queensland. Christian believes in fostering an educational system which recognises that both personal fulfilment and social responsibility are compatible and that the pursuit of excellence is not in conflict with equal opportunity for all. Christian understands the importance of a financially sustainable and accessible health system in both the public and private health care sectors. Christian is a specialist physician. He's a fellow of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians Chapter of Addiction Medicine, the Royal Australasian College of Medical Administrators, the Australian College of Remote and Rural Medicine, and the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners. Minister O'Rourke, first we come to you. You have the floor. Thanks very much, Sue. And if I can firstly start by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land in which we are gathering all across the state this evening and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, if I can also acknowledge my colleague, uh, the Honourable uh, Dr Christian Rowan, and also if I can acknowledge and thank uh, the CEO, Amy McVie from QCOS for hosting this evening's event. Uh, this is an incredibly important opportunity for us to be able to tell the audience uh, what it is we stand for um, as government, uh, but also for the audience to ask questions about what's important to them um, and have those questions responded to this evening. Um, I want to thank uh, the sector as a whole. Um, I've had the opportunity um, to work very closely with them over the last three years. Um, in the community sector and disability services and seniors for uh, about five and a half years now. Um, and it's been an incredible opportunity. Uh, we wouldn't have got through to where we are today without um, the work that has been done from all the peak organisations and the people that work in the sector. This year has certainly been um, a very challenging year, um, as we heard from Amy earlier, in relation to some of the challenges that Queenslanders are experiencing across the state um, and people finding themselves in situations that they never thought they would find themselves in before. Um, so I wanna, I, I wanna very much thank the sector because without you, we wouldn't be where we are today. And I also want to thank the Premier for a very, very strong health response because the health response that we have seen uh, delivered and committed to over the past few months uh, with COVID has seen us in a much stronger position than uh, other countries and other states across Australia and the world. Because of the strong health response that we have been able to deliver, what it has enabled us to do is now focus on a strong economic response so we can actually support Queenslanders to recover and build and come out better than they were before. So I wanted to just briefly touch on some of the areas that um, the that QCOS has presented in their priority statement for the 2020 election, uh, because these are incredibly important areas and do impact on families right across the state. Um, and one of those is the um, importance around uh, the NILS loan. I've had the opportunity to meet um, 
people that have applied for these loans, as well as the people that work um, in our good money stores, both in Cairns and on the Gold Coast. Um, and I was very pleased that the Premier was able to announce um, a further $6.2 million over two years to support this program. What that will see is $4 million going to support 20 workers within the non-government organisation space that will actually assist with financial counselling and also with the application of the, the no interest loan scheme itself. Uh, what we will also see from that commitment is $2.2 million for the provision of emergency relief. And that will go to the 87 emergency relief providers across Queensland. And this is to identify and assist with, uh, we know what Queenslanders are facing at the moment and to be able to support them during this time. Um, Amy mentioned the making rent fair, uh, which is incredibly important, and we are undergoing um, a significant reform in the rental space and um, looking at the reforms within the Residential Tenancy and, and Rooming Accommodation Act. That particular process has entailed significant consultation um, with the sector, with tenancy boards, uh, with property owners and so forth. Unfortunately, during uh, COVID, a lot of that consultation had to be set aside so we could focus on our health response, um, but a re-elected Palaszczuk Labor government will continue that work moving forward. Um, it is also um, a focus with particularly on the making energy efficiency um, quite affordable for families. And that is in relation to um, our program that is putting solar panels on public housing, the trial that we've undertaken. And that was about 840 public houses that we've put um, solar panels on um, so far. We've also worked with Lockhart River um, to uh, build a solar farm out there to provide um, community the responsibility and also the benefits that will come from the savings that will come from that. Homelessness is a huge issue and we know that uh, there is more social housing required. Um, I also know from a disability space that having um, appropriate accommodation is incredibly important and is the foundation for um, supporting people uh, moving forward in their life without a roof over their head. Um, everything else just seems to come crashing down around them. In 2017, we made a commitment of a $1.8 billion commitment to our housing strategy, and that was to support the construction of uh, more than 4,500 um, social housing homes and over 1,000 affordable homes. Um, this is being um, met on, on our three-year target we have actually exceeded the construction of homes and we are well on track to meet our five-year target. With our economic recovery plan uh, from COVID, the, what we will also see is a further boost uh, through the Works for Tradies program, which is a $100 million program, which will see an additional 215 social houses built across Queensland. Uh, Amy did raise a very interesting, uh, a very important point earlier in relation to raising the age of criminal responsibility to 14. And I know this issue does create uh, very robust debate uh, with some very strong opinions on that. And I completely understand that. Uh, in 2018, Bob Atkinson uh, publicly released his report, which outlined 77 recommendations. Of those was the um, inclusion of national advocacy, um, sorry, advocacy on a national approach to raising uh, the age of criminal responsibility. So this is not just as simple as raising the age. This is actually about understanding what we need to put in place to support these young kids to not go down the path of crime um, and actually have the appropriate services available. So the commitment from the Palaszczuk government was um, to be part of the national working group um, and to look at jurisdictional responses and to monitor this closely uh, for further work that will be done. The overrepresentation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in the child protection system. 
the key to this is the investment in prevention strategies, um, programs that have resulted in the stabilisation of numbers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children going into care. Uh, we have seen this stabilisation over nine consecutive quarters um, and what it has done is actually reversed the growth trend that we had previously seen. Uh, programs like um, supporting the health of mother and babies are key to actually gaining long-term sustainable improvements. Um, in November last year, we launched the Growing Deadly Families Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Maternity Services Strategy, uh, and that was to provide culturally safe and appropriate maternity services uh, across Queensland. And we've also initiated um, our way, a generational strategy for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander children and families, which articulates our commitment uh, to eliminate the disproportionate representation by 2037. A lot of work being done to make sure that we are actually working directly with the community. Uh, and in relation to working directly with the community, that has been the commitment that I have undertaken over the past three years is to work directly with the community to understand exactly what the funding requirements for neighbourhood and community centres to support their local communities um, is required. This is more than just simply plucking a figure out of the air and um, saying we will fund X dollars. And this is the work that we have done uh, with Griffith University to actually understand um, the foundational requirements and make sure that funding is, is delivered in a way that directly supports uh, the work that is done out there in the community um, each and every year moving forward. And that is something that I know the Palaszczuk government is well and truly committed to and has um, accepted um, to look at the report and the recommendations and make the decision moving forward with regards to appropriate funding. Uh, but I want to thank you for the opportunity and I look forward to the questions that will come. Um, and thank you very much for the evening. Thank you, Minister. I now invite Dr. Christian Rowan, Shadow Minister for Communities, Disability Services and Seniors to speak. You have the floor. Thank you, Sue, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, can I begin by acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past, uh, present and emerging. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to attend this evening and join in uh, the Queensland Council of Social Service 2020 uh, State Election Leaders Debate. Uh, can I also acknowledge uh, the Minister, the Honourable uh, Coralie O'Rourke MP and other organisational uh, representatives here tonight, including CEO uh, Amy McPhee and all other uh, participants and people who are joining us online this evening. Uh, we know in Queensland that Queenslanders are hurting with more than 209,000 Queenslanders now being out of work, whilst others have, been giving, have given up looking for a job completely. And with an unemployment rate at 7.7%, Queensland now has the highest unemployment rate of any state in the nation, including Victoria. Now, the Palaszczuk State Labor Government has cancelled this year's state budget, which means they are flying blind through the biggest economic crisis in almost a century. And it must be remembered that Queensland had the nation's worst unemployment rate well before the coronavirus pandemic. And uh, Queensland has also had the highest number of bankruptcies and the lowest level of business confidence. And this has all been before the coronavirus pandemic. Can I take this opportunity to thank everyone online through all of the organisations in the community services sector who've been doing some amazing work over the last six months. It's been vital work on behalf of vulnerable Queenslanders and we know that you will continue to do that into the future. In Queensland, we continue to see the highest levels of youth unemployment rate in the nation and the highest number of long-term unemployed. In contrast, ladies and gentlemen, the Liberal National Party has an ambitious plan to stimulate the economy, create a decade of secure jobs and drag Queensland out of this recession. The LNP's plan for a stronger economy is to secure jobs based on four foundations. Investing for growth, unleashing Queensland industry, supercharging the regions and securing our children's future. The Liberal National Party is the only party that has a plan to create a stronger economy and secure more jobs. By building a stronger economy and providing for good sound economic management, this means that we can invest more in social services. And that's exactly what the Liberal National Party will do across Queensland. So on community and neighbourhood centres, we know that our communities are under increased pressure, which is like why initiatives like more funding for community and neighbourhood centres, 
including programs to stop domestic and family and violence, are more important than ever. A future Frecklington LNP government will support a $14.5 million per year boost to community and neighbourhood centres. The LNP will continue this funding boost for the duration of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we will work with community and neighbourhood centres on a sustainable funding model. And to lift the capacity of our community and neighbourhood centres, we will support the Community Organising Capacity Fund by providing an additional $1.5 million over four years. On social isolation and loneliness, with restrictions on family gatherings and social interactions because of COVID-19, social isolation and loneliness has only increased. An LNP government will develop and implement a new social isolation and loneliness strategy. Such a strategy will be informed by a parliamentary inquiry that the Liberal National Party will establish in the first 12 months of a Frecklington LNP government being sworn in if we are successful on the 31st of October. An LNP government will also secure the funding of the Ways to Wellness pilot for three years. To help new Queenslanders, the LNP will also provide funding of $1.3 million for three community coordinators based in community organisations and funding to train 100 cultural community leaders on the prevention of domestic and family violence. This commitment is in addition to the LNP's uh, funding boost of $1 million in extra funding to the Women's Legal Service and an additional $1 million to other frontline legal and support providers of domestic violence and or sexual violence support. On cost of living, we know Queenslanders are struggling to manage household budgets. With increased cost of living pressures through skyrocketing electricity bills, higher water charges and the highest car registration costs in the nation. Since the Palaszczuk State Labor Government was elected in 2015, it has introduced nine new or increased taxes, ripping $4 billion out of the Queensland economy. In its woefully inadequate Queensland State Budget update, the Palaszczuk State Labor Government failed to match the Liberal National Party's no new tax guarantee for the next four year term. The LNP is committed to reducing cost of living pressures for Queenslanders so that reliance upon predatory lending practices can all be eliminated. To ease cost of living for seniors, the Liberal National Party will introduce free off-peak travel for all seniors across the city train network, which stretches from Gympie to the Gold Coast and inland to Ipswich. The LNP will also provide $500 vouchers for students starting full-time university and TAFE courses across Queensland to pay for bus or train fares or petrol if they live in areas lacking public transport. Additionally, a future Liberal National Party government will introduce a new incentive scheme for safe drivers to help them save money. The LNP will reward safe driving in Queensland with the release of a new 10-year gold driving licence. While there are many uh, sanctions applied to drivers who infringe traffic laws, other than insurance, there are no incentives to recognise and reward safe driving behaviour. It is proposed that, though, that for those drivers who have not accumulated any demerit points in the 10-year period leading up to their licence renewal, they will be rewarded with a 10-year licence for the cost of a standard five-year licence. Furthermore, to address cost of living pressures for Queenslanders, the LNP has announced that if successful at the upcoming state election, every Queenslander who owns a registered car will receive a $300 car rego rebate before Christmas. This will help to drive Queensland's economic recovery by immediately injecting $1.15 billion into the Queensland economy. On housing, concerningly, under the Palaszczuk State Labor Government, the waiting list for social housing has increased by more than 9,000 to over 25,000. In comparison, the previous Liberal National Party government reduced the public housing waiting list by 7,000. Labor's rental reforms and property taxes have also negatively impacted the housing sector by discouraging further investment in residential property. The Palaszczuk State Labor government's promised $100 million build to rent program has not delivered a single new affordable dwelling, placing further pressure on Queensland's social housing demand. The Liberal National Party has a bold plan to reduce land tax for new build to rent housing projects as a part of a plan to create thousands of construction jobs and secure investment in Queensland should the Liberal National Party win the next state election. Under the LNP's new scheme, land tax would be slashed by 75% and exemptions on international investor taxes would be provided on eligible build to rent projects. This plan is expected to secure $2 billion worth of investment, create 4,600 construction jobs and 4,000 new homes over the next 10 years. And this is very important for those who are vulnerable and disadvantaged in Queensland. Reducing tax on build to rent projects is a pro jobs policy that will mean more work for carpenters, electricians, plumbers and suppliers. We will deliver the certainty needed to build and create jobs in these uncertain times. There is no doubt when Queensland is building, Queensland is working. 
The build to rent revolution is happening and a Liberal National Party government will put Queensland right at the front of this job creating sector. In disability services, a future Liberal National Party government will work collaboratively and constructively with the disability service sector towards the best possible outcomes for people with a disability. We want people living with a disability to be fully included in the community and to their lives to be lived to the full. In mental health, the LNP supports community mental health service to, services to ensure that those who need help receive the support that they need. Community mental health services take the pressure off our public hospital system that is already overwhelmed while increasing support for patients and carers. We know previous reports that current community-based services remain limited and ad hoc. Unfortunately, many people with mental illnesses are still ending up homeless and without the support they need. We also support the increased use of step up, step down facilities to help patients transition back into the community from hospital based care. The LNP has also announced a comprehensive plan to tackle the scourge of ice, announcing four new rehabilitation and detox facilities across Queensland. We believe in the importance of increasing treatment options for families struggling to break the cycle of addiction, which leads to a range of other health conditions. Our ICE strategy also increases support for early intervention and education and targets high risk demographic groups within our community. On child protection, the LNP will overhaul Labor's broken child safety system from the top down. LNP state leader Deb Frecklington has announced a range of significant bold new measures to fix a broken system and protect the most vulnerable in our community. And there are a number of strategies that we will embark upon to achieve that outcome. On domestic violence, everyone deserves to live safely and free from the threat of violence. It was the former Liberal National Party government that uh, commenced the Not Our, Not Ever report, and that has had bipartisan support in relation to many of the important recommendations. But we know that more needs to be done uh, here in Queensland. The murder of Hannah Clark and her three children illustrated that Queensland's current laws are clearly failing to protect uh, victims. An LNP government will be relentless in ensuring domestic violence policies are up to date and working as they should be. In relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander partnerships, the state LNP team is committed to work with the Federal Morrison Coalition Government, with the Federal Minister for Indigenous Australians on the reformed 16 Closing the Gap targets and working on a performance framework here in Queensland, particularly with respect to in, uh, reducing uh, Indigenous carceration, not only for children, but also uh, our First Nations uh, peoples overall. In conclusion, can I say that the next election is the most important in a generation. The Liberal National Party has a comprehensive set of economic, social and community policies, all committed to getting Queensland working again. Thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to join you this evening. I very much appreciate uh, the chance to discuss the LNP's policies and plans. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rowan. Uh, now you've heard both the pitches. We commence our Q&A with you, our audience, the Minister and the Shadow Minister. So keep submitting your questions via the Q&A chat box. Uh, we will commence this evening's Q&A with a question from Karen Walsh, the CEO of Micro Projects. And Karen asks, the COVID recovery plans across the world have included significant investments in social housing. So the social housing question again, and commitments to end chronic homelessness. The evidence shows that having the economic benefits of a housing first approach far outweigh leaving people to cycle through homelessness. Additionally, we've seen the federal government indicating that homelessness and social housing is the purview of states. Will your party step in and put a roof over the heads of the 25,000 people, uh, families on the social housing register and the 22,000 people sleeping rough by building thousands of social housing dwellings? So Minister, we'll first come to you. You've, you've already mentioned uh, the commitment to social housing that the government has underway, but it's clear that it's not covering the full need. So one of the points Amy pointed out tonight was we could do it during COVID. Why can't we do it in a more ongoing and systematic matter going forward? So please elaborate on what your party will do to address these 25,000 families and the 22,000 people sleeping rough. Thanks, Sue. And if I can thank Karen Walsh uh, for the question that she's put forward this evening. Um, as I stated before, uh, we do have a $1.8 billion housing strategy, which we are working on delivering uh, for Queensland. Um, we are so far at this point in time um, ahead in the delivery of those houses, which is good news. Um, but uh, we have obviously uh, definitely more work to be done. We know um, that there has been significant work done uh, with the Department of Housing 
who have worked with uh, non-government organisations across the state to support people uh, in the COVID response um, to make sure that uh, we've got accommodation. Now, that may be accommodation of a temporary nature um, to make sure that they are safe, that they are off the street, that they are adhering to uh, the restrictions that were in place at the time. Um, but obviously, the additional uh, funding that we've committed to uh, the $100 million for the um, Work for Tradies program uh, will also go towards the creation um, of social housing. Uh, what I do know uh, with uh, appropriate accommodation for people, particularly um, vulnerable people um, and the disability space, um, that this is not just a commitment that um, one government can make. This is a commitment that um, all levels of government actually need to back in uh, to support people um, to get out of a stage of poverty, but also states and territories need the assistance of a federal government to uh, address the construction of the level of social housing that is needed. Um, what we have seen with the $1.8 billion strategy that we have delivered, uh, 4,500 houses for social housing and over 1,000 for affordable housing, an additional 215 for uh, the $100 million. But yes, we've got a lot more to do. Um, and that's the work and the commitment that the Palaszczuk government will make um, to Queenslanders is that we will work very closely uh, with Queenslanders and the sector to partner uh, with other organisations as well to make sure that we have a roof over Queenslanders heads uh, when they need it. So we heard from you about uh, retrofitting some social housing with solar panels, which again seems such an obvious thing in the sunshine state. Are we going to see more in that direction? Yeah, look, we have um, a very much a commitment around renewable energies um, and we have a target of 50% um, of renewable energies by 2030. Um, a, a lot of that is um, putting uh, solar panels on, on houses across the state. Um, and we are seeing that move forward quite quickly. Uh, when we started, we had about 7% um, towards our target of renewable energies. I believe now we're over 20%, um, well on our way to 50%. Um, so the trial for solar panels um, on uh, public housing uh, saw that delivered um, through 840 houses um, and the benefit that that has uh, seen for the tenants in those houses. Uh, and I know that the government is looking at all avenues to make sure that we can uh, move forward and further that uh, uh, trial um, in all areas across Queensland. Uh, but also, as I also stated earlier, um, the support for uh, local communities, particularly in the remote areas. Um, we've done the trial in Lockhart River uh, with the construction of a solar farm to actually uh, reduce the level of diesel um, and also increase uh, the benefits for the community members in the way of savings. Thank you, Minister. I'm moving to the Shadow Minister now. In terms of social housing, we heard your discussion of land tax and, uh, and some commitments, but if you think about these numbers, we've had significant uh, need uh, during the COVID period to put people in social housing as a health measure. Why can't we do this normally? Uh, we've seen both leaders in constant high vis and hard hats, um, but where's the focus on construction in social housing? What's, what's the plan from the LNP? Well, I think if we go back again before COVID-19, the uh, housing wait list was increasing under the Palaszczuk uh, Labor government. And we also had in Queensland uh, debt increasing uh, even before COVID, $91.8 billion. So uh, each man, woman and child in Queensland owing uh, on the public credit, credit card over $16,500. Uh, unemployment being consistently over 6%, lowest levels of business confidence, highest numbers of business bankrupt, uh, bankruptcies. Uh, and so what that means for Queensland is, is that when uh, the current government was investing in social housing before uh, COVID, uh, they weren't able to provide uh, the proper resourcing to be able to meet the needs. And that's why the housing wait list has blown out under the Palaszczuk uh, State Labor government. Now you've had uh, COVID arise and there is significant uh, distress for many people. Homelessness uh, has increased. There are certain demographics where it's more problematic. Uh, and what we need in Queensland is a government that understands 
uh, that in collaboration with the private um, sector through public private um, partnerships and having uh, different models for different geographical regions to ta tackle uh, the prevalence uh, of uh, homelessness that exists there in particular demographics, that there needs to be a flexibility and an agile framework uh, that can deliver for those communities and those people who are experiencing uh, homelessness. Now, um, certainly that can be done uh, under the former Newman government through the successful Logan Housing Renewal Initiative. Uh, we did that previously when in government and we can certainly uh, do it again through those collaborative uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, but certainly all governments have a responsibility to work uh, collaboratively and constructively together to achieve uh, those outcomes, not only here in Queensland, but across Australia as well. And uh, the state LNP team under a Deb Frecklington LNP government would work collaboratively and constructively with the federal Morrison coalition government. We wouldn't uh, pick fights with them. We would work collaboratively and constructively uh, to achieve those outcomes, not only for vulnerable uh, Queenslanders, but for service organisations, uh, which are helping to support uh, those people um, as well. So it's only through responsible economic uh, management that you're able to do that, that the public sector is able and government is able to collaborate with the private sector uh, to achieve that. And ever, as I'd alluded to in, in my comments uh, earlier in my speech, uh, we certainly have a comprehensive uh, build, build to rent program, uh, as well as those land tax reforms to encourage uh, private sector investment into this state, to, uh, into this space to work collaboratively with the government to achieve uh, these outcomes. Thank you, but do you have something of the scale of 1.8 billion? I mean, what, what, what kind of quantum are we looking at for that build to rent scheme? Well, look, it's, it's, you know, in the absence of no budget and no plan, the government hasn't uh, provided a comprehensive budget this year. So we are flying blind in Queensland. Certainly uh, the LNP believes that we can uh, foster these collaboratively, collaborative and constructive models to work with the private sector to obviously deal with the blowout in the current uh, social, social housing wait list, as well as uh, deal with the uh, significant uh, emergence of uh, additional people who will be coming uh, and becoming homeless uh, because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and again uh, we once we know what the the books are like and and what's actually clearly uh, contained within those um, then we'll be able to provide uh, further detail all right we're going to move on now to community neighborhood centers now here is something that's got the sector scratching its head these are sites that deliver a lot of community support you've both mentioned them they meet people's immediate needs they help people navigate services they um, deal with that social isolation and loneliness you were talking about. They deal with skills development, family engagement, building financial and economic inclusion, advocacy skills. But despite all this great work, their base funding remains woefully inadequate. So while the sector welcomes your gratitude and your expressions of support, we need to see some serious funding uh, in these longer term strategies. So the, sec the sector generally is looking for these centres to be better funded across Queensland. So what's your response to this? And if in government, what would you do to actually improve funding and support for these community sectors? So this is a question from Chris Mundy from Queensland Families and Communities Association. Gillian Marshall from Logan East Community Centre and Deb Crompton from Mount Cravat Community Centre, Go Mount Cravat. So first I'll come to you, Minister. Thanks, Sue. Um, and thanks to Chris, uh, Gillian and Deb uh, for the question. Um, when we came into government in 2015, uh, there was a commitment to increase funding to neighbourhood centres. Um, and we actually increased the funding uh, by about $12 million on what was previously funded. We bought the base rate um, of funding for operational um, expenses for neighbourhood fundings uh, that was increased um, to $110,000, $115,000 uh, per centre. Okay. Community and neighbourhood centres also rely very much on uh, funding from a range of different areas, and that's to support the great work that they do in areas of homelessness, domestic and family violence, uh, financial counselling and so forth. Um, but yes, uh, and that is the work that we have been doing um, with the sector, with QFCA uh, and also with Griffith University um, to really do the research behind what that funding model needs to look like. Um, as I said earlier, it's, it's very easy to uh, pick a figure and say that we're going to fund 14 odd million dollars, um, particularly through COVID, but that's not ongoing funding. That's just for the duration um, of the pandemic from the LMP. What we're looking at is actual increased funding operationally 
not only to provide um, the support that they need, but also to address the safety issues. Um, we know that a lot of these organisations are running on uh, one full-time employee, which does create safety issues. Um, and that's why we did increase the funding. We've committed um, more than $12 million uh, to build new uh, neighbourhood and community centres and refurbish um, old neighbourhood and community centres. Uh, we've also introduced the Thriving Communities Grant, which actually enable neighbourhood centres um, to identify um, things that they can uh, apply for funding for up to $25,000. Uh, and I've seen, you know, simple things um, like in the Sunshine Coast, uh, they were able to uh, put shade cloth out the side which in itself seems quite simple, uh, but what it actually did was reactivate an unused area of the centre, which now they have been able to include more community members and provide more services. Um, so it's a small amount, but it does actually go a long way. So I know that the Premier is absolutely committed and understands the uh, plight of neighbourhood and community centres. The work that we've done with Griffith, that report will be presented um, to Cabinet uh, for consideration and um, implementation of recommendations uh, should a Palaszczuk Labor government be re-elected. Okay, thank you. Moving to you, Shadow Minister. You mentioned community centres. Can you commit to funding for these centres and do you have a, a plan for how you would decide that kind of quantum? Well, thanks, Sue, and, and thanks to, uh, to Chris, to Gillian and, and Deb for the question. Um, we have already committed to maintaining the funding of community and neighbourhood centres, uh, but as I also said, a future uh, Frequenton LNP government will support a $14.5 million per year boost uh, to community and neighbourhood centres uh, for the duration of the pandemic, and we know that that uh, funding is required immediately to deal with some of the uh, issues that are coming forward in relation to homelessness, uh, mental health uh, distress, domestic and family violence uh, situations and circumstances, and that that funding boost is required uh, immediately. But we've also given a commitment as an LNP state team that we would work with the sector on a sustainable uh, funding model into the, into the future and, and fair and reasonable indexed uh, funding. Uh, now, why we've said that we will uh, work with the sector on that into the future is because, again, uh, we don't know what the state of the books are at the moment because uh, there is no budget here in Queensland uh, for this year. Uh, but we've not only given that um, emergency boost in funding that we know is, is desperately uh, needed across those centres and a number of uh, those uh, community and neighbourhood centres that I've visited not only recently but over the last uh, few years as well, they, they have been doing some amazing and very important work, uh, not only recently, but over, over many, many years. Uh, and so to the staff uh, who've been providing those essential support services, can I thank you on behalf of the Liberal National Party. We know that you do, do need a, a reasonable, fair and index sustainable uh, funding model into the future. We know that you need a funding boost uh, immediately uh, to service that. And that's why we've announced that $14.5 million injection uh, per year, each and every year, uh, that occurs as far as the uh, or the continuation of the coronavirus pandemic. That was something that we announced at the uh, Queensland Community um, Alliance. Um, and recently, just to give one example, I was up at the uh, Encircle uh, Redcliffe Neighbourhood Centre where, where the LNP announced specifically for there a $200,000 uh, commitment boost uh, to their services um, because we know that they've been doing important work there. So uh, the LNP has already announced uh, that commitment. Um, uh, as well as that injection of, of funding boost, but we will work with the sector on a sustainable uh, model into the future. So just while we're on this idea of sustainable funding for the sector and how we work out reasonable funding models, what about the on overall um, funding model for funding the community sector generally? So one of the questions from Dr Ian Law, who is the CEO of Relationships Australia in Queensland, he says the state government engages in siloed funding for specific problems rather than a holistic approach to the myriad of issues that individuals, families and communities face. How can the funding model from government change? So I might come to you first, uh, Shadow Minister, on this one. Well, I think it's very important that when it comes to uh, departments, that departments need to be fit for purpose when it comes to um, the best possible outcomes that they can deliver for Queenslanders, regardless of where they live. And we certainly know that uh, there can be very uh, siloed structures where there isn't good collaboration and coordination. Um, and when we're talking about good social uh, health uh, and other outcomes for individuals and their communities, 
Uh, there needs to be good collaboration um, and coordination. Uh, the models that exist in particular communities, one size uh, won't fit all and they need to be customised uh, to particular communities and particular uh, regions. There needs to be good engagement and good consultation uh, and working collaboratively and constructively with those organisations um, on the ground. So that means government working with for-profit and not-for-profit uh, sectors and organisations to ensure that the, uh, the models that they uh, put in place in particular um, communities or regions or service programs, uh, that they're achieving the outcomes that they're funded uh, to do, that there's strong accountability and performance uh, frameworks, that there's appropriate uh, reporting back to government on those outcomes that are, that are achieved. Um, and that's the fair and reasonable thing to do uh, to people who may be uh, disadvantaged or requiring those things. So uh, there needs to be consideration of how uh, there's greater fostering of collaboration and coordination that requires uh, ministerial leadership to achieve that, that requires government leadership to achieve that. It also requires uh, the state government to work collaboratively and constructively uh, with not only the federal government, um, but local councils, uh, for-profits and not-for-profit organisations. Thank you, Shadow Minister. Uh, Minister, just reflecting on your time as Minister, is this something we could do better in relation to the way we fund the community sector? Thanks, Sue. Absolutely, we can. Uh, and that's what um, the Premier acknowledged at the beginning of this term um, and with the establishment of our advancing Queensland priorities. These priority areas uh, have stemmed from consultation that we have had with Queenslanders across the state and some of the major issues that um, they are facing. The priority areas uh, really focus on bringing government agencies together. They actually work collaboratively um, and put in place plans to address um, over a, a staged uh, strategic uh, time frame how we can actually address some of these priority areas. So that's government coming together and actually working better, understanding that a siloed approach is not the way to go. But also from a community perspective, it's actually that place-based approach. And that's the work that we've been doing. Uh, we've got the Logan Together program operating, which uh, focuses on zero to five. Uh, and we've recently announced um, in this term, uh, the collaboration with the Commonwealth to expand the place-based approaches. Uh, and we were seeing that um, in Rockhampton and Gladstone. Um, what this does is provide funding to what we refer to as a backbone organisation. And what that organisation does is work directly with the community, non-government organisations, the state and federal government to identify a specific area that that local community is having an issue with and how they can work together to actually progress that issue and provide positive outcomes moving forward. Um, so this is a really positive approach. But what we do need to understand is that it's government identifying how they can work better and community understanding how they can work better and then bringing everything together because we know with a place-based approach what works in one community may not necessarily work in another community but what issues are being experienced in one community may be very different to another so it's actually about identifying what's needed and working collaboratively to actually advance that. Thank you. So we've got some agreement there that we need some more place-based approaches and we need a little bit more innovation in funding models. Um, now we're, we're taking a different tack and we're coming to you, Shadow Minister. We have a video question from Lindsay Wagner, CEO of Peak Care Queensland. Lindsay Wagner, Peak Care Queensland. This is a question for Dr. Robin. Recently, Peak Care, in partnership with the Queensland Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Job Protection Peak, what's it? conducted a survey about the LNP's proposals for overhauling the child protection system. The survey findings were mixed, with high levels of agreement with some proposals and high levels of disagreement with others. Proposals where disagreement was expressed by a vast majority of the almost 2,000 survey respondents included firstly, renaming the Child Safety Department the Child Protection Force, and secondly, the no second chances model, where the children of parents who had two positive drug tests would be removed and placed in foster care. Both were regarded by most as far too extreme. Will the LNP, if elected to government, be prepared to reconsider these proposals on the basis of the feedback that has been collected? Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, 
those policies are policies which we are taking to the state election. Um, but I would have to say that in relation to the LNP's policies, we all also have a strong focus on uh, pre uh, prevention and dealing with uh, recidivism uh, and recidivist offenders. Um, however, the LNP believes that there needs to be strong accountability and communities need to be uh, safe and that uh, people need to be appropriately uh, dealt with by the justice system. However, if we're, we're to uh, not only close the, the, the gap when it comes to First Nations people or deal with um, other young offenders who may exist out there, uh, we certainly need to be ensuring that they get the uh, opportunities that they need, that they have uh, safe houses, access to uh, education, access to good health, uh, the uh, job and employment opportunities that they need uh, for the future. And that's why um, in Queensland, part of the conversation needs to be about who is best placed uh, to deal with the economic circumstances that we find ourselves, not only before the coronavirus pandemic, uh, but now following the coronavirus uh, pandemic, who is best placed to rebuild Queensland and ensure that uh, government has sound economic management and can invest in the vital uh, services uh, and supports that are needed uh, to ensure that people um, don't fall into a life of crime, um, that they have uh, access to uh, not only uh, education, but health, but employment opportunities, uh, but certainly when it comes to uh, accountability, the LNP strongly believes uh, that people who do uh, commit offences need to be held to account. Um, they certainly need to uh, have opportunities uh, to, re to redeem their behaviours uh, and to be meaningful citizens. Um, and the LNP uh, does, makes no apologies when it comes to ensuring a strong accountability for some of those uh, offenders. All right, thank you. Minister, do you want to respond at all? Yeah, thanks, Sue. Um, and if I can thank Lindsay for the question. Um, since 2015, the funding that's gone into uh, the child safety system um, is, is unprecedented from any previous Queensland government. We've invested um, almost $730 million um, into uh, the child safety system. And um, although there is increased demand and a system that um, does experience pressure, what we have seen during that time is a decrease in the caseload for child safety workers, workers who do an incredible job um, under very difficult circumstances. Um, that caseload has reduced from 21 cases to 18. Um, yes, we have more work to do, but this is work that actually needs to be done with the sector. Uh, having a hard-lined approach uh, and not actually working directly with the sector, which is what we've done over the past five and a half years to identify how we can address together the incredibly challenging situations that families undertake. Uh, drug use we know is a major issue and the introduction of uh, drug testing um, was something that was delivered um, under the investment for, through the Palaszczuk government. But we need to understand what these challenges are and how to best not only support the children, but also to support the families. And that again comes back to having um, a cross agency approach to actually support the families um, in areas where they need to be educated, supported, counselled, um, and also making sure the children are safe. Um, having a two strikes, you're out policy um, does nothing really to support uh, the education process for a family. We do have to keep our children safe and that is what we have focused on with the investment um, that we've undertaken over the past five years. Uh, but we will continue to invest to provide uh, we've provided more than 550 additional workers within the child safety system, uh, but we know we've got more to do and that's what we will do with the sector. Okay, thank you. So a clear policy difference between the parties there on their approach to child safety from different angles. And this leads us into a question about the, um, the Human Rights Act, which uh, came into force on the 1st of January this year. So uh, the question uh, uh, from the uh, QCOS member is that, the Act can only promote and protect human rights if it's accompanied by committed political leadership and systematic and ongoing education for public leaders and officials. So how will each party further embed the Act to ensure the protection of our most vulnerable Queenslanders? Shadow Minister, I'll come to you first. What is the party's position on the, the Human Rights Act? Well, we've given a, a strong commitment to uh, continuing the Human Rights Act here in Queensland and, and the Human Rights Commission and the, uh, the funding that's already been provided uh, to there. 
Um, again, uh, with respect to funding moving forward, I mean, we don't have a budget again uh, this year, but uh, the LNP has given a strong commitment to the Human Rights Act, Human Rights Commission and the funding that the, the government has allocated uh, for the purposes of not only uh, ensuring the implementation, but the ongoing uh, work uh, that's been done here in Queensland around that. Okay, thank you, Shadow Minister. Minister? Uh, thanks, Sue. And this is something I'm actually really incredibly proud of to be part of a government that implemented the Human Rights Act. This came from uh, a lot of work out in the sector um, and some uh, a significant level of consultation to make sure uh, that the Human Rights Act moving forward uh, was fit for purpose and delivered in areas that the sector was telling us, that the community was telling us. Um, so we've done a lot of work in the preparation for the delivery and the implementation of the Human Rights Act. Uh, there was establishment of a human rights uh, working group across government to support all government agencies to prepare and make sure that their um, policies, their legislation and so forth uh, was compatible uh, with the Human Rights Act. Um, and we, everything that we do moving forward from a policy decision, legislation, regulations and so forth, um, must have a statement of compatibility. Um, so we've got a, a, obviously a, a well entrenched commitment to continue moving forward with the Human Rights Act, um, because we know how incredibly important it is. Thank you both. Here's a million dollar question. How do your parties propose to address the scourge of domestic and family violence if you're elected on the 31st of October? So Shannon Minister, you've already referred to the Hannah Clark inquiry and uh, to some efforts uh, your party would make. Would you care to elaborate? Well, look, I, I would say again that going back to the former LNP government um, where Dame uh, Quentin Bryce handed down the not, now not ever report, there has been strong bipartisan support here in Queensland in relation to the implementation of those recommendations. And I think fundamental to ending the scourge of domestic and family uh, violence uh, is leadership. And, and I would have to say that um, both major political parties in Queensland have had that spirit of bipartisanship when it comes to articulating uh, the reasons uh, why domestic and family violence uh, should never occur. Uh, and it, that cultural change that needs to happen uh, across Queensland will continue. Um, but I think importantly, from a political perspective, uh, having that uh, that spirit of bipartisanship, uh, there's not uh, a lot of things that, um, that that can be agreed in politics, but I think this is one area where uh, people absolutely concur that it's it's completely unacceptable, uh, this occurring, that, that, that children have the right to grow up in safe house, households, uh, that people should never be uh, subject to some of the heinous things that, that, we've, that we've seen, uh, and that we need to be continuing to uh, implement those things to deal not only with offenders, but all of the other strategies which go with respect to uh, prevention and education and respectful relationships. Uh, there's still a lot more work to be done in, here in Queensland and across Australia and, and even internationally. Uh, but I think that if, if we continue uh, with that level of uh, good collaborative bipartisanship from a political perspective, uh, we can make gains into the future. And again, I know that there are many uh, organisations who are doing some important a service work, that they're doing that work on the ground. Uh, and I certainly acknowledge that and thank them for their contribution. Actually, just to stop you there, you, you mentioned the Women's Legal Service. And this is another area where there was some very welcome surge funding during the pandemic to deal with certain things. Um, and, and the very much increased uh, demand for um, domestic violence services. But again, it's the question of longer term funding and stability for the domestic violence legal services uh, that they're interested in. So, you know, what we've done during the pandemic, could we continue and extend into the future so that their funding is more predictable and more, you know, able to be depended on because there's just not that predictability in the current funding model. Well, that's why in my earlier comments, I announced that, announced that uh, funding injection, but importantly, uh, the Liberal National Party, uh, if we are successful uh, in obtaining government on the 31st of October, will work with the sector on sustainable uh, funding models into the future because we know that it is important uh, to have fair indexed and sustainable models. Uh, but again, at this stage, with no budget and no plan, the current government is unable to provide transparency when it comes to that. Uh, but the injecting, injected funding boost that we're talking about are to obviously give some immediate uh, money into the sector because we know that it's needed for a variety of reasons at this particular point, but we will work collaboratively and constructively with the sector to get those sustainable funding models right into the future. All right, thank you. Coming to you, Minister. So around the domestic violence funding, again, 
you've uh, the Labor Party, I, I understand, has committed to reform around coercive control. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, thanks, Sue. Um, and firstly, I think if I can go back to say um, the now, not, not, not now, not ever report that was handed down. Um, the government accepted all recommendations and has worked through the implementation of those recommendations. We've seen uh, more than $550 million um, invested into the prevention of domestic and family violence. Um, this is an incredibly um, difficult situation and I do agree with Dr Rowan in uh, that it, this is bigger than politics. This does require bipartisan support on all levels of government. We need um, societal change, um, attitudinal change, if we're actually going to achieve real uh, progress in this area. We need people to stand up. The, the funding of uh, domestic violence awareness programs, um, allowing people to understand what domestic violence is actually made up of and to helping people to understand that Domestic and family violence is not just physical abuse. As you said, coercive control um, is a very huge part where people uh, tend to, to, to let it slide or not see it for what it is. Um, so actually putting in place um, that strategy around the reduction of coercive control is incredibly important because I know personally, I, I have uh, friends who have spoken about either their own um, situation and or a friend of theirs, their situation around coercive control and how that actually impacts not only on their lives, but the, the lives of their families. Um, so this is an area that should be above politics. And I do welcome the bipartisan approach from the opposition um, because this is something that we need to work together with um, and all levels of government need to work together with. I think that's right. I think that the sector will be looking for this bipartisan support to move into really deep preventative work uh, in the domestic violence sphere. So staying on gender equity, we want to know whether your parties have women's health policy and action plans and how your parties will resource women's health programs and services that address the current and ensuing pink recession, as we're calling it. And this question is from Emma Iwinska, who's the CEO of Women's Health Queensland. So I might come to you first this time, Minister. Thanks, Sue. And if I can thank Emma for the, her question. Um, this is uh, uh, an issue that um, is obviously very close to my heart as a woman, um, but I am very, very thankful to be part of a government um, that uh, we've got across, across the caucus about 50% women. And I know that that brings with it um, such a diverse range of conversations and the way that we look at things um, collaboratively across the entire caucus um, is, is really very interesting um, and very informative. Um, so gender in inequity, uh, the Palaszczuk government has been, um, again, leading the way as one of the first Queensland governments to actually focus on gender equality um, and support for women. Um, we have a women's strategy um, and we know that focusing um, on empowering women um, and identifying areas where um, we need to address that focus, health, well-being, um, support against domestic and family violence, um, opportunities for education and employment. Um, and I'm actually very proud to be part of a government that does put women um, at the forefront of what we're doing to make sure that we, we have an equal um, identification and representation across all areas. Thank you, Minister. Shadow Minister, coming to you now around this idea of uh, increased funding for women's health services. What is the plans of the LNP, leaving aside the budget issue? <laughs> Sure. Well, look, I mean, uh, the LNP has a range of uh, health policies, which certainly uh, support women. And if I can just touch on 
rural maternity services, as, as an example, the LNP is committed to restoring uh, maternity services in many rural and regional uh, communities. We know how important uh, it is for women to be able to have their children closer to home and the fact that they have to uh, travel to larger uh, centres can mean that they're on the road late at night time and exposed to a whole heap of uh, other risks associated with that and, and partners and other family members have to travel away from home and disrupt uh, employment and their social circumstances and other children going to school. So uh, the LNP has committed to a range of uh, health uh, policies which are applicable uh, to women. We certainly uh, support uh, gender equality and empowering women. Uh, we have many uh, senior women in our, uh, in our party at both the state and, and federal level um, and continue to, to foster that. And the federal coalition government has made uh, a number of uh, appointments to boards. So um, the Liberal National Party has a strong track record of supporting and empowering women and also having policies uh, which support uh, women in various uh, endeavours and whether that be uh, socially, economically uh, helpful from a business perspective and we will continue to do that as a state LNP team uh, should we be successful winning uh, the state election on the 31st of October. I'll hold that thought because I'm going to ask you about now another social equity issue. Uh, so we know that uh, COVID's shown us all that having a safe place to call home is imperative when you need to socially isolate or when you need to work from home. COVID's also reinforced then the need for updated legislation to strike a fair balance between renters and landlords. Will your party commit to reviewing the Residential Tenancies and Rooming Accommodation Act and implement reforms like ending unfair no-fault evictions, implementing minimum standards and allowing pets? And this is a question from Penny Carr, CEO of Tenants Queensland. I'm coming to you first, Shadow Minister. Well, the LNP has always believed in, in fairness when it comes to the arrangements between uh, land uh, holders and, and tenants or, um, or landowners and, 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 and tenants. And it's very important that there is a fairness and equity uh, that's applied there. So we've always committed to a, a fair and a balanced um, framework. And the last uh, thing that anyone would want to see is that there are people who are disadvantaged or vulnerable losing uh, their particular houses, but also uh, land uh, holders or, or owners themselves, they have their own uh, obligations um, as well that they need to fulfil and that might be with uh, banks or other financial institutions uh, and other processes. So um, you really, it's, it's always very difficult to legislate for goodwill and, and that's what we need when it comes uh, to tenants uh, and, uh, and property owners. We need a, a framework which fosters a goodwill uh, between both parties to ensure that there's a fair and equitable outcomes that are achieved uh, for both. But I mean, it's an asymmetric relationship of power between a landlord and a tenant. So I think what the Tenants Council is saying to you is that perhaps you need some more minimum standards around uh, uh, evening up that power relationship between the landlord and the tenant. So how do you broker that? You, do you agree that you need to have some law reform in this area? We certainly need to have a strong level of uh, protections. Um, certainly vulnerable uh, tenants uh, can't be left uh, in the lurch. Uh, but it needs to be a, a fair and balanced um, framework and there needs to be good dialogue and good discussions and an LNP state team uh, would be willing to work with the, with the sector and obviously get this right when it comes to what's fair, balanced and reasonable for all parties involved. And not necessarily law reform. Well, you, you look at those things um, if you're in government um, and, and what, I, what I would say again is uh, that when it comes to that, we've always believed in fairness and equity and ensuring that there's a reasonable and fair balance that the people who are uh, disadvantaged uh, or who are vulnerable, uh, that they do have protections um, in place. Uh, and certainly we would do that. We've done that previously and we do that into the future to ensure that fair and reasonable protections are in place. What about the pets issue? Everybody in COVID has needed support animals, I think you'll find. So what about the issue around allowing pets for residential housing? Have you turned your mind to that? Well, again, I think it comes down to what's what's fair and, and reasonable around that. And it's very hard to legislate for every uh, particular set of circumstances. But I think there needs to be fairness and equity when it comes uh, when it comes to the reasonable set of circumstances and for protection for tenants uh, when it comes to that. But certainly uh, we would have a look at that because the framework that we want to have is about fairness and equity and what's reasonable, uh, what, what protects both parties. Uh, and, and again, we would work uh, with the sector uh, and listen to what they're saying and try and ensure that there was reasonableness and fairness when it comes to all parties involved. Okay, so a commitment to dialogue with the sector. Um, Minister, what would Labor do in terms of reforming the Residential Tenancies and Rooming Accommodation Act? Thanks, Sue. And as I said in my opening remarks earlier, we've actually already started this work. Um, there's been significant consultation um, across the sector from the tenant side, 
from the property owner's side. Um, yes, I do agree that it is definitely uh, the requirement for fair and reasonable support in both areas, uh, but we have already started the work on this reform. Um, and it's been a, a very collaborative approach. Obviously, there's some areas that can be some sticking points for um, certain uh, groups, um, but that's the whole point of actually coming together and working together to create good reform. Um, so we have already started this work. Um, we've already worked through um, the first stage of these reforms with the sector. Um, COVID put a little bit of a, a hiccup in that work, um, but the commitment uh, to continue that work with the sector, because we know these areas are incredibly important. We know of tenants who have had uh, ovens that haven't worked for months on end that um, haven't been repaired by the owner. We know of uh, property owners who have had tenants leave um, unpaid rent and potentially damage. So having a, a balance between um, what is required on each party is what this reform is all about. Okay, thank you. So we're coming now to payday loans. So 300,000 payday loans were taken out by Queensland residents last year, with 15% of this cohort expected to end up in unsustainable debt. And we know these payday loans are uh, increasing even more this year. So last week, the ALP committed $4 million over two years to fund re financial resilience workers who will help Queenslanders without access to mainstream credit options, access the no interest loan scheme, which we discussed earlier uh, with Amy. So will the LNP commit to a similar program? So coming to you, Shadow Minister, uh, are you concerned about this increasing use of payday loans and what would you fund or would you uh, uh, agree in principle to funding financial resilience workers who will help people without access to credit? Well, I think the most important thing is throughout this uh, time is building a floor under those people um, who need it. But we need to get ahead of the curve when it comes to uh, creating jobs and providing meaningful employment uh, for people into the future. So uh, what that means is having sound economic management to be able to uh, create jobs and whether those jobs be in uh, construction, whether those jobs be um, in the private sector, in the mining and resources, agriculture and other uh, key industries across Queensland here. So um, it's, it's a combination of ensuring that there's a floor and that those people are supported um, at the moment and they get the assistance that they need. Uh, but importantly, we need to ensure that into the future, uh, unemployment comes down, that there's a clear and comprehensive uh, strategy uh, to do that. That's why the LNP has announced a number of uh, economic policies to stimulate economic growth uh, here in Queensland, our no new tax uh, guarantee uh, to also stimulate uh, the growth of jobs um, in business uh, across, across Queensland and also announcing our uh, target rate of 5% for unemployment here in Queensland. And that's getting ahead of the curve and ensuring that people uh, who are vulnerable uh, have the opportunity to be able to get meaningful employment, to have the dignity of work, uh, to be able to look after themselves and their families uh, and to work uh, in, into the future. And that's certainly what an LNP government will do here uh, in Queensland. Thank you, Shadow Minister. We're going to squeeze in a final question to you both. Uh, this is about skilling uh, Queenslanders. Just, uh, here we go. It's about the home stretch campaign and it's uh, coming from Leanne Wood in Anglicare, Southern Queensland. And she said that the home stretch campaign has uh, delivered that every dollar invested by the Queensland Government in extended care and support for young people in care up to 21 years old um, generates $2.69. So every $1 generates $2.69 in savings or increased income due to improved social outcomes. This applies across foster care, residential care, semi-independent, non-approved living arrangements. Why have neither the Government nor opposition committed to provide extended care and support for all young people transitioning out of care to adulthood when it makes both social and economic sense. So um, we've got three minutes each to answer this question and that will be the final question of the night. Coming to you first, Minister. Thanks, Sue. Um, and look, we know supporting young people as they transition out of care um, is absolutely imperative. Um, and the Palaszczuk government has committed to um, providing that support, um, particularly in relation to um, you know, uh, around the education, employment opportunities, training opportunities. Um, it's, it's a difficult situation, particularly with regards to um, 
making arrangements similar to foster care, um, supporting with um, payments and so forth. Um, but there's a commitment from the Premier to um, advocate on a national level um, that we look at, um, that they look at how they can implement payment models for young people that are similar to foster care. Um, but making sure that they've got the services and supports available to them um, to uh, effectively upskill coming out of school, leaving um, in-home care um, and effectively creating a life of their own. Uh, and that's something that um, we have worked very closely uh, with uh, the sector on. The implementation of the Next Steps Plus program um, actually focuses on supporting young people um, from the age of 15 to develop those skills. Um, and that's in the process of going out to tender at the moment. So that would be mm -hmm. non-government organisations um, providing an opportunity to support those young people moving forward. Okay, thank you, Minister. Shadow Minister? Well, certainly it's a very important thing to continue to do. And it's not only the, the right thing to do, but it, it makes economic sense as well. And I think one of the things that the LNP state team would be very keen to do is to partner with the sector again uh, to capture the data in relation to the uh, the enhancements, the improvements, the outcomes that are being achieved, uh, because that can certainly uh, then uh, justify a further investment um, in those programs and assisting in that way. Uh, and I think some of the work that is done in the community's uh, services sector um, is great uh, collaboratively and constructive work which is being achieved, um, but some of the, the outcomes and the data that is being achieved uh, has not been as uh, optimised as it possibly could when it comes uh, into uh, government sort of assessment when it comes to further service planning and uh, and funding investments into the future. So a future uh, LNP uh, state government would be very keen to partner with the sector to ensure that that, uh, that data is captured, um, that there is a uh, an evidence-based way of ensuring that additional funding is provided because it's the right thing to do uh, and it's cost efficient as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you can see the sector often trying to put the business case to government and getting frustrated when the economic case is not, you know, it doesn't seem to win the argument. So I think you'll be seeing more of that um, kind of advocacy from the sector. But we've got we've got time to squeeze one last question in because it's from Helen from North Queensland. This election is all about North Queensland. So we are going to squeeze Helen's question in and it's about the Skilling Queenslanders for Work program that's coming to an end. And she said it facilitated transitional pathways towards ongoing employment for people who hadn't participated in the workforce for quite a while. It has been seen to boost self-esteem, increase professional and personal skills, provide valuable qualifications needed in what has only become a more competitive job market. So COVID has added further disadvantage amongst these cohorts and they were already struggling. Have either of the party leaders given consideration to continuing a similarly geared, much needed program post-election. So could you revive skilling Queenslanders for work? Um, I'll come to you first, Shadow Minister. Well, certainly the LNP has announced a number of policies which will not only protect jobs, but create jobs, and particularly with respect to infrastructure uh, planning and, and applicability to North Queensland, and whether that's four-laning uh, the Bruce Highway from Curra to Cairns, whether it's building the new uh, Bradfield scheme, where, whether it's supporting the mining and resources sector, um, as well as investing um, in our roads, bridges and, and dams, uh, with, with significant applicability to North Queensland. So we believe in the dignity of work. Uh, we believe that an LNP government can create the right economic uh, circumstances and framework here in Queensland to ensure that people uh, do get into work and whether that be people in uh, trades, our plumbers, our electricians, whether it be people in small business and in various uh, sectors, including mining resources and agriculture. Uh, and all of our policies and announced uh, commitments to date will ensure that, gr that jobs are growing, uh, not only uh, in North Queensland, but right across Queensland uh, as well. And that's very important for uh, communities uh, throughout Queensland. Thank you, Shadow Minister. Coming to you, Minister. Thanks, Sue, and a big shout out to Helen from North Queensland. Uh, this is a, this is a, a Palaszczuk government signature program. Uh, this was actually a program cut by the previous LNP government. Uh, we in, reintroduced it when we were elected in 2015 because we know the importance of providing skilling opportunities and the work opportunities that that ultimately delivers. Um, the program itself is uh, funded through to mid next year, um, but. I'm certain that, as I said, we know how important it is. We reintroduced it. So I'm certain that we will be following through uh, for the first four year term uh, with such an important program. 
Thank you. Uh, that is a really important point for this election. It's a guaranteed four year term for the first time in Queensland history. It's a big prize to play for. Uh, so there is more time to plan brilliant consultation with the community sector. That's what that means. So uh, we're coming to the end of our debate. Uh, a big thank you so much to the Minister, the Honourable Coralie O'Rourke, and to the Shadow Minister, Dr Christian Rowan, for their time this evening. Thank you for being so generous with answering these questions and making yourselves available. We've had so many fantastic questions. We're sorry we couldn't get to them all, but we will make sure we pepper the candidates with those questions on their way out of the building. Uh, we hope that you valued having your voices and your questions heard this evening and we thank you all the members of QCOS everybody on the line for your time and participation so shortly we're going to share an email with a link to the QCOS election us and a link to an evaluation survey we greatly appreciate your feedback so if you have a minute to complete this we'd really appreciate your time that's a wrap from the QCOS 2020 state election leaders debate thank you and good evening <laughs>